It's good to be able to take some time to talk to you all today. Talking about beef, everyone loves beef, right? That's easy to, easy to cover. Of course, we're doing it right after lunch. Here's what I want to talk about today, my layout. First, we're going to talk a little bit about the U.S. beef industry, why we trade. We're a major exporter. We're also a major importer. We'll talk about that. Also, a little bit on the current situation in the U.S. cattle and beef sector. We're undergoing a major trend change right now in the markets. And uh, then we'll drill into the TPP agreement and what that really means and end with some summary points. So with U.S. beef, the, the question comes up, why trade? We produce a lot of beef. Why do we export a lot of beef and subsequently import a lot of beef? Well, there's a couple different reasons. One is export premiums. There are cultures and countries that will pay more for some of our products than our domestic industry will. So that's a no-brainer, right? We can export. Now, if you're a cattle producer like Kevin, you're cutting short ribs off your cattle or chuck rolls, some of these cuts we don't use a lot here, we have the opportunity to export chuck rolls and short ribs to Japan where they generate big premiums. Now, when we ship a lot of that, if we kept those here, some of that would go into ground beef. We would grind them for ground beef, which is a low, low price product. And so we export those products into higher price markets and then imports come in and get ground to replace and offset some of those exports. But for producers, it's a win-win because we get to take each cut on that carcass and go get the highest price, whether it's domestically or abroad. And so the imports flow in to support that ground beef sector as well. And so it makes a lot of sense uh, for the industry to generate profits through trading. We also have a lot of underutilized cuts. Can you guys tell what these are? We've got a beef tongue here on the left. We, we process 26 million cattle a year. That means we have 26 million beef tongues a year. Now, I doubt that we're eating beef tongues, right? A few people maybe have eaten beef tongue, uh, but not on a regular basis. And so roughly half, maybe a little more than half of those beef tongues are eaten in Japan today. That's a major win-win for us because not only are they sold in Japan, they're sold at premiums into the Japanese market. And so uh, my math says a three and a half pound tongue is worth about four dollars a more in the four dollars a pound more in the international markets in Japan. That's a fifteen dollar a head profit just from the fact we can send tongues to Japan. Uh, the the other one here is tripe in the middle, and and as you know, or maybe you don't know, cows have four stomachs, and each of those stomachs has a different flavor profile. I didn't know that. But uh, this is Bible tripe here, and we send a lot of that to Japan as well. Commands a premium. On the right, you can see short ribs. You've probably had short ribs, um, but Japan pays a premium for short ribs. Also Korea, Hong Kong, a lot of the Asian markets. And so that's a real opportunity for us with underutilized cuts to be able to bring profits back into our beef sector through trade. All right, so if we look at, at net exports, here you can see this is total dollar value of what we export minus the dollar value of what we import in beef. Now, if you recall, 2003, when the, we had a BSE discovery, mad cow disease, you recall that? It was an imported cow tested positive for mad cow disease. That shut our export markets. And you can see that on this chart. All of a sudden, all of our export markets closed, imports kept coming, and you can see the change. But under normal circumstances, Net trade of beef generates one to two billion dollars a year back to our beef industry. Now 2015, you can see there, we have a situation where supplies got very tight in the US. Prices went record high. We pulled in more imports uh, to supply the markets. And so we actually had a trade deficit in 2015. We're going to shift gears the other way, especially into 2016. Imports are plummeting right now. We're, we're reducing imports and we're expanding our production. If we look at that dollar value, that uh, total export value, and divide it by the number of head, these are the key products. Now, you may not know what offal is. Offal is variety meats. It's organ meat. And so if we add the total value of beef hides, beef offal, and the actual beef itself, uh, last year, 2014, we generated $325 a head in overseas money from those cuts. So for cattle producers, every calf check they get, $325 of that really came in the form of pesos, won, yen, whatever it is, came from overseas buyers. And you can see there the trend. You can see again the BSE, the big 
gap, the hit we took when the market's closed, but how we've recovered. Now, we're still not sending as much volume today as we shipped in 2003, but you can see the substantial increase in value. So if we look at that trade and what it means, U.S. is a different kind of beef. There's a lot of different beef in the world, and global beef is not all the same thing. We produce grain-fed beef. Worldwide, it is a gold standard product. Now, it isn't all ribeyes and tenderloins, as I showed you. It's a lot of underutilized cuts, but it's still highly marbled, has a very strong uh, safety profile, and a high quality, and it's affordable around the world, especially these lesser utilized cuts. And so that's really the standard out there. Growing incomes, rising incomes, rising populations have increased world demand for beef. We're adding 78 million people a year to the planet. That's roughly nine New York cities every year. And so as incomes rise, as population rises, demand globally is getting stronger for beef. But our challenge is this. That global beef market isn't an open free market. It's held together with a thick web of restrictive trade barriers. A lot of those are high duties. And so there you can see. Today we pay 38.5% duty into Japan. On a global trade standard, that is very high. We were paying 40% in Korea until we got the Korean Free Trade Agreement, which is slowly phasing that out. So those exports bring major premiums back into our sector. As I talked about rising demand, here you can see it. This is global beef trade. It isn't just the US, but this is all suppliers beef trade. Total tonnage and total US billion dollar equivalents. And there you can see, it's up over $35 billion, $36 billion in 2014. And you can see the growth in demand for trade. That's driven by rising population, rising incomes. It's also driven by better technology. We can ship refrigerated meat all over the world very easily today. And as that technology improves, the, the ability to participate in that global market increases. But the competition is very fierce out there. Here you can see global beef exporting countries. Surprising to many people, India is actually the biggest beef exporter in the world today. Now the majority of that beef is water buffalo. India is a major dairy producer. And they have found that uh, there's a lot of money to be made exporting beef. And so while the Hindu population considers cattle sacred, they're talking about the Brahma cattle, the water buffalo have been exported. And that's grown very quickly. We really don't compete with India in any key markets. It's a very different product. And actually, if you consider Australia, New Zealand, Uruguay, all of these are grass-fed, largely, production systems. Grass-fed beef is a different uh, flavor profile than grain-fed. So we don't necessarily compete. But if you look at the US on this chart, you can see the, the stagnant growth we've had versus the others, really driven by tight supplies. During that time period, we have had declining U.S. beef production. And so we've done very well in the export markets for having a very tight supply of beef. So if we look at the situation right now, we just saw this year we'll see the smallest beef production in the U.S. that we've had in 20 years. We've been in long-term decline. It's been tough on the industry. Um, but what happens with markets? You decline the supply, you reduce the supply, economics 101, right? What happens to price? Prices go up. And we've hit the level where prices have been very strong now for two years and expansion is occurring. And so the real risk for the cattle industry, we're going through this time period where we've had high prices, we're expanding a lot of cattle, we're going to be much more dependent on those global markets. Prices have started turning lower on that higher production. Export growth is much more important to the beef industry when we're expanding. Think about it. When, when supplies are declining, exports are great. But when supplies are declining, prices are going up. Now, when you go into a spot where production's expanding, exports become very important to the industry. And that's where we're heading today. So right now, we've got these falling prices, production starting to increase, and we've got commodity deflation. Right? Have we seen what's happened with gas prices? I gassed up under, under uh, what was I, $1.98 the other day out in Idaho, a gallon. Um, crude oil went below 40 bucks this week. Commodity deflation is real, and it's all over. It's not just in the, in the energy sector. We've seen it in dairy. We've seen it in grains. We've seen it across the commodities. 
And so as those prices come down, we have some real risk. A lot of those high priced cattle were bought last year, put into feed yards. Now those cattle are worth a lot less. We are facing record high feedlot losses in the cattle sector this year over the winter. Um, January 1, we see the beef herd being up probably about a million head from a year ago. So this expansion is, is real, it's underway. Again, export success is really critical in that scenario. Here's just a chart on that commodity deflation. And there you can see that's a Bloomberg commodity index. It's agriculture commodities, it's metals, it's everything. But that commodity pressure has been very real uh, in these markets, particularly in the agriculture markets. So let's talk about TPP. I'm not going to read all this, but as we look at the TPP agreement, Japan is absolutely critical to the U.S. beef industry. And the access gained was very, very good. Uh, Japan agreed to phase out their beef duties from 38.5% that we pay today down ultimately to 9%. And uh, you can always look and say, maybe we can get a better agreement. Maybe we should renegotiate. Um, we got a pretty good deal on beef. Uh, for example, the Australians went through a free trade agreement with Japan. They got a beef cut down to 19%. The TPP takes us to 9%. So it was a better deal than the bilaterals that Japan has, has signed. Also, we're getting a cut on the offal items, the tongue, the, the tripe, those other things. Those duties come off fairly sharply as well. They're at as high as 21% today. Um, they're going to be eliminated in 16 years. A lot of these cuts have, a, have an immediate year one uh, discount. So year one, we go from 38.5% duties to 30% duties. And so it's a big deal, especially to get that first year, uh, first year cut. You can see on here Peru, we get a, a break there on duties. Vietnam, uh, those duties phase out in three years for beef. Uh, we phase out the off-all duties over five years. Vietnam has, has potential for us. It's a market that we can compete in. Um, we have duty-free access in the other major markets, so they're not as big a deal. Canada, Mexico, we're already shipping beef duty-free. So let's talk about Japan. This chart shows uh, data on the value of these U.S. cuts domestically without Japan, and then the green part of the bar is the value of those cuts with Japan. Now, the way we know what Japan's worth is, unfortunately, in 2003, we had the mad cow outbreak, and Japan closed. And so what we did, we looked at what these cuts were, were and this is on a per head basis. So the red area on short plates, that's what short plates were, were are worth domestically without Japan. The green area is the premium we get when Japan is open. Now this is per head. So you think of a rancher out there with 100 head, this is a big deal. And we add up all those premiums, we get the $64 a head premium just from Japan. This is a one single market. Japan is our biggest market. It's $1.6 billion for the US beef industry. There is no other market really comparable in terms of the value that we derive as a U.S. cattle industry. But these are the main cuts. Now, a lot of people don't know what short plates are. I didn't know what they were until I got involved in the international market. You'll never see them on a retail case. But if you've had pork belly, which is bacon, the belly, that's basically the equivalent on a cow is a short plate. That's an item that we would grind up and put into hamburger here domestically. But with Japan open, we can cut those short plates. They pay a significant premium for them. But this just gives you an example of what this market really can do for us on a per head basis. Again, we process 26 million head of cattle a year. So you do this math and it adds up very quickly the added profits from Japan. Also, um, you can see here, this is the variety meats or the off-ball, the average export price per pound of U.S. And so we ship like Egypt there. We ship a lot of beef liver to Egypt. It averages 54 cents a pound. We ship a lot of rounds to Mexico, a lot of, or not rounds, a lot of tripe and a lot of those other things. But look at Japan there, 348 a pound. Um, this, this is a market that truly does add value to these underutilized cuts. And you can see there, the duty cut under TPP will phase that duty down from 12% to zero in 10 years. And the first year it gets a 50% cut. So that's a pretty big kick. 
we look at tonnage and, and duties paid, I've just calculated how much we pay in beef duties to Japan. So the blue bars is the tonnage, and there you can see the big BSE break when we have MagCal and how we've kind of climbed out of that. But you can see last year we paid almost $500 million in beef duties to get beef into Japan. Under TPP, that would cut very quickly year one, and you can see the duties phasing down. At the same time, that increased access would spur demand, bringing volumes up. And so if we take that total duties that we pay, that's a major piece of this pie. It makes us competitive not only with the other major supplier, Australia, in Japan, it also makes us very competitive with domestic Japanese beef. And today, almost half of the beef consumed in Japan is produced in Japan at a very high cost. And so this would open that market up to us uh, to compete there as well. So if we take these total duties paid and we divide it by the number of, of cattle that we process in the U.S., you can see we're paying about $21 a head on everything we produce here to get that beef into Japan. On a long-term average, the margins for cattle feeders and the margins for beef packers are less than $21 a head. So the duty we're paying is more than the long-term average profit margins in our feeding and packing sector for Japan. All right, here's the, here's the big kicker for us in Japan. It's competition. So this chart shows you this is where we were in Japan with Australia. Before BSE, we each had about half of the market. BSE hits, U.S. is closed out, Australia takes 90% of the market. As we've regained access, you can see there, for years we started to increase and close that gap. But in January 2015, the last point on that chart where it goes back up, Japan implemented their free trade agreement with Japan. And their beef duty today is 29%. And so that beef duty fell. They got an FTA signed before we did. And so for 2015, our beef exports to Japan are down 15% because Australia has a preferential duty. Now, Australia's duty, that big cut isn't over. It's going to continue to phase down every year that we're not in this market. And so this is what really ignites the fire under the TTP discussion for beef, is every week, every month that ticks by, we're losing market share in Japan. TPP would level that playing field for us. If we look at where we are, this is just January through September. Australian shipments of beef into Japan are up 150 million. U.S., by the end of the year, we're going to be down over 100 million because they have that FTA advantage over us. So if we look at where Japan is, they've been very active in the trade world. They've implemented a lot of free trade agreements. Um, TPP's negotiated. But under negotiating, the one to notice is Canada. Japan is negotiating a Canadian free trade agreement, or Can Canada has initiated that free trade agreement. Because if TPP fails, if we do not get TPP done, the Canadian beef producers are still going to make sure they have good access into Japan. We don't have that. And so if something happens and this TPP deal doesn't go through, not only is Australia at a major advantage, but Canada will also likely be at a major advantage in the market. So those other benefits, we talked about Japan. Vietnam, I mentioned that. It's a, it's a population, almost 90 million people. It's a big market. It's also a very low uh, income market. We can compete in low income markets. We ship beef off all, we ship beef to over 111 countries this year. Uh, we can compete in these markets if we have good access. And good access means low duties. So here you can see we're phasing out those beef duties, we're phasing out off all duties. Big opportunity, not, not like Japan, but it's a market we can grow into in the future. Uh, we have existing FTAs uh, with these other TPP agreements. We have Canada, Mexico, obviously. Singapore, Australia, Chile, we already have existing agreements. So why support TPP? We've got the duty reduction. We're talking 20 bucks a head. That is a big number when we talk about margins on our cattle. More competitive price for US, uh, of U.S. beef for Japanese consumers. We can compete with their domestic market. We will see volumes grow into there. It levels the playing field with Australia. It also opens new opportunities into some of those lesser markets. So what's life like without TPP? If we do not get this deal done on behalf of the beef industry, where do we land? 
where do we send our beef? I would tell you that no other success in the global market will compensate for a failure in Japan. There is no other market we can ship that beef to. If you look at this chart, this is global beef importers by source. So the first bar, the US, we're the biggest beef importer in the world. And then Japan, Hong Kong, Russia on down. So those are the importing countries and the colors show the suppliers. So the orange area that you see on that chart, that's US beef going into those markets. Look at US beef into Japan. If that goes away, where can you spread all of that orange across those markets? You can see there how significant this is. We do not have another option. If TPP fails over the next 10 years as that Australian duty comes down, 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 and we stay at 38.5%, we are slowly going to phase away from Japan. It will slowly close to US beef. Not totally, but the majority of that market will be gone. And there is, you can see here, there is no other option. There's no way we can really succeed without it. Australia would love it if we didn't get TPP done. They want us to drag our feet. They're doing very well in Japan taking that market share. Um, you can see their, their duty cut. We've lost 5% of the market just this far this year. Um, we will lose more of that market every year that we don't have a similar agreement in place. At Jan 1, that Australian duty will go down again. So, summary, global deep beef demand is growing. Uh, will we be able to compete? Will we get our foot in the door through this agreement? That's a major, major variable for the beef industry. Our cattle producers are facing rising production. We have cattle producers in all 50 states. They are all concerned about where these markets are going as we increase production into this environment where we have global commodity deflation. Prices are already starting to come down. The TPP puts us on a level playing field. It gets us back competitive into Japan with Australia. And delay is not an option. Like I said, every, every week, every month, we don't have an agreement. Our beef industry is slowly getting pushed out of Japan. With that, I will wind it up and turn it over to Mr. Kevin Castor. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Kevin Kester. I was born and raised on the central coast of California. My family's been in the ranching business in the central coast of California since the 1860s. I represent the fifth generation of ranchers in my family in our area. And I'm fortunate enough to have uh, three children. Uh, two of them are grown and one's uh, still in college at uh, Oklahoma State this year. And so the reason I'm here today is just to reinforce all the strong points that Brett made, uh, I want to impact upon you how important it is and how it uh, reflects and Im impacts a rancher and a producer back at home. And hopefully uh, you represent some of those districts you can relate to that. So uh, the reason I'm here is because I do have that sixth generation and in the last six months we have a first grandchild so now I have a seventh generation. And my goal is to keep the options viable for the next generation and the generation after that and maybe the next generation after that if they choose to have the opportunity to stay as ranchers and produce food for the world. And so with this, we're here today to try to make sure that your bosses understand why it is a hugely important thing when it comes time to vote in favor of the TPP trade agreement that your bosses will give a considerable favorable recommendation and give an upvote on it. So uh, why is that important? Why should we be in it? So as the screen says, I guess I haven't the one doing the clicking, why should we support it? Brett kind of went over all that really well. Uh, it eliminates uh, all the tariffs in the future to the 11 other countries uh, except uh, Japan, but it brings Japan down to that 9% level in 15 or 16 years. That's hugely important from the current 38.5%. Japan's a big deal, as Brett said, over $1.6 billion in 2014. Our number one export market for beef, hugely important. So every year when we sell our steers and heifers off the ranch, I can look at each steer and heifer, and over the past few years, every steer and heifer that leaves the ranch, more than $300 of that value is our export markets. 
And that represents about 20% of the total carcass value for each heifer and steer. So when I'm looking at those heifers and steers, I'm seeing one-fifth of that heifer, one-fifth of that steer represents our export value. And so if our export values go down or are diminished, then uh, we don't make uh, the margins or the money that we need to stay in business for the future generations. And that's important because I think those of you, especially from rural districts, understand that ranching has really margin, small margins, and so any little hiccup along the way, whether it be Mother Nature or trade agreements, can have a direct impact on us staying in business. So it is very important. And in addition to that, as Brett alluded and showed up on the screen with uh, countries like Australia, every year that goes by, even this January 1 coming up in three weeks, Japan, through their bilateral agreement with, uh, with Australia, Australia will have another percent or two trade advantage over us. And so every year we wait, we lose that competitive advantage and we'll lose market share. And that's really a huge deal to us. Also, trade, uh, from the Trans-Pacific Partnership allows us to be the leaders in the trade community. If we don't act on this, as you can see, in, as in today and other places in the world in different issues, the U.S. is going to lose a position of leadership. China is sitting out there wanting to do uh, its own trade agreements and be the leader in the uh, Pacific Rim. So if we sit on our heels and don't get this agreement passed, it's going to not only hurt us directly with our 11 other countries involved with this agreement, it's also going to hurt us in the bigger picture out into the future with countries like China taking our place. And that has a huge impact on us, not only for agriculture, but other industries. So I, I just can't stress enough how important this trade agreement is to the beef industry. It truly is, all the way back to the ranches and farms. So should we worry about imports because of it? And my answer is unequivocally no. We generally don't have any trade restrictions are very little in the beef industry with other countries sending their beef here. And in fact, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but our domestic beef cow herd in the country here doesn't have the capability of providing enough lean meat to make enough hamburgers to feed the American public. We have to import lean beef from countries like Australia and other places in order for McDonald's and, and hamburger makers to have enough hamburger patties to, to feed us. So, uh, it's, and it's important because otherwise, in order to meet uh, domestic demand on beef, we would have to grind up more expensive parts of the carcass and use it for hamburger instead of maybe shipping it overseas and getting those premiums and making those extra dollars that, which will help keep my family in business. So, it truly has an interrelated connection and it is important and also, uh, as the other point says, I guess I should keep up with my talking points here, that China, place, countries like China that want to step in and be the leaders in trade in the Pacific Rim will have that opportunity if we don't participate in TPP. So what about waiting and, and uh, negoti renegotiating? Well, that should not happen because of the reasons stated. Uh, of course, TPP is not perfect. If it was perfect, we'd all be at 0% tariffs and everybody would have free and open access and we'd be in our merry way. But in Japan specifically, with our, the number one importer of our beef, beef was one of their uh, protected ag commodities that they fought tooth and nail for. And so for somebody like me who's had uh, the experience and in, in been involved with trade issues over the past 10 years or more, uh, for Japan to to negotiate and agree to 9% over 15 to 16 years, that's a real win for us. It truly is because um, our negotiators, uh, did, I don't care what side of the aisle we're on, uh, I think the USTR did a great job on this negotiation. And we were involved with them and communicating the whole time and, and part of the process and, and uh, I, I gotta give them credit. They did a good job for us. Again, I can't stress enough, Australia is just sitting there like Brett indicated, that they're waiting, hoping we drag our feet because every January 1, 
with their bilateral agreement with Japan, they have less and less tariffs. We're stuck at 38.5% and we lose margin. And that's costing us money. And so, um, again, I've already said it twice, China's just sitting there waiting to act when we're not acting and that truly is a significant impact in the future. And so, if we do go ahead and the U.S. passes, the Congress passes and, and we sign TPP into effect, then uh, we will truly be the leaders in the Pacific Rim with the trade agreements and I think we will have leverage over China for ag, especially beef, uh, into the future because right now, as you all know, we're still locked out of China uh, for beef, U.S. beef access. And uh, we're working on that and I think TPP would help us have the leverage to gain uh, U.S. beef access into China too in the future. So with that, I just wanna um, just make sure everybody understands that these trade agreements being 20% of the value for everything we sell off the ranch is hugely important to us. Our margins are thin and so the sooner we can get this trade agreement before Congress and get it passed, uh, hopefully it'll keep my grandkids in business. So with that, Kent, Brett, turn it back to you. Thank you. <laughs>